All right, well, let's give thanks, as we always do, and uh, step into, hopefully, we trust the work of God. Oh, God, we do thank you that we can come before you. It's been a little while. I'm glad to be back. And thank you for this time we have on these Thursday nights. In this season when we see so much discriminatory love, going out and doing things and buying things for those we choose to love, we stand in awe of your indiscriminate love, of loving all of us, whether we repent or not, whether we're good or bad, whatever it may be, that all that then matters is our response to you. So please, may our response to you tonight be to respond to that love, and to seek your love, and to be in your life, and to spread that warmth throughout our world, that we all start begin loving indiscriminately with the love that is you. So help us tonight to see that through the pages of this Bible. Holy Spirit, again, please inspire whomever you will to say whatever needs to be said as we share. And we ask this all through the one who makes it possible, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right, well, let's get back to, uh, to where we were, looking at one of the great, great, great heroes of the Bible who, like all of us, still had some things to learn along the way. There we go. So to recap where, where we were, this whole third section, this last section of this foundation series of trying to understand the context and the mind behind the Bible is focused on... The, what happens when this transformation changes our relationship most of all with God. And this is the big point for that whole, this whole third section, that by being transformed by grace into the divine nature, we are able to relate to God as God relates within himself. And so we saw that this is the foundation of our relationship with God. It doesn't start there. Starts wherever it is, whatever hook of selfishness he used to get us and draw us toward himself. But from there it needs to grow. And so we, we saw in the book of Philemon of how God prefers love to obligation as the foundation of, his, of our relationship with him. And we look through that, that wonderful letter to see how you know, Paul is saying, I could order you, but I don't want to. I'd rather this be love. And we saw that really mature relationship where finally Paul comes out and says, I know that you'll do even more than I ask. Because that's the way love works. In fact, I never told you the end of the story, did I? Of what happens to, to uh, Onesimus. Um, there are two possibilities that we see from history, but don't find out from the scriptures. There is a tradition that Philemon and Aphia, his wife, and Archippus, his son, and Onesimus were all martyred together in Colossae. But there is another, which is perhaps a little more rooted in what we do have, Remember I mentioned the letters of St. Ignatius of Antioch, who's writing much letters. So at this time, Onesimus would have been a very old man. This is about 50 years later, which is possible. He was probably a young slave when this letter is written. And Ignatius is writing to the various churches in Asia Minor as he's on his way to being uh, sacrificed, to being fed to the lions, fed to the animals in Rome. And he addresses the bishops. And when he writes to the bishop in Ephesus, the major city of that entire area where St. Paul, Paul had put St. Timothy until Timothy was martyred, he makes an interesting pun on the name of the bishop. The same pun we saw in the book of Philemon. The bishop's name is Onesimus. It's kind of interesting if that's the way the story, the story turned out. That not only did Philemon receive him, but Onesimus goes on to become one of the most important bishops of the entire region, taking over the major city of, of Ephesus after Timothy's death. So, interesting how these things do work out. So let's come back to the, to the story at hand. So we looked at that as a model of our relationships, truly founded on love as, as the basis of our relationship. And we started then talking about what happens when we move off of that that what are the dangers, what other kinds of distortions in our relationship can we see? And we looked at the pitfalls of when we have these distorted relationships. And we looked at things like obligation, knowledge, responsibility, fear, 
our human good, nationalism and patriotism, all kinds of things that sometimes become the foundation of our relationship with God. And as I say, it's okay if we start there, but we can't stay there because God prefers love as the relationship to any of these because that is the relationship he has had within himself forever. And we spoke about what happens sometimes when these distorted relationships become corporate, become part of the entire church that we're in, or parish that we're in, or congregation. You know, we can become the church of the people who know the right things. And that usually goes someplace really bad, because we start saying, we're the church who knows the right things, so therefore everybody else must be wrong, so we must be the only ones who have this right. That gets us into a dangerous place. You know, or become the people of the church of people who do the right things, very socially responsible, very active, but sometimes building a religion that has very little to do with God and is everything about our good deeds and our acts and our social justice. You know, we're the church of nice people, strong in fellowship, who get along really well with each other, build a nice society, but again, building a church that doesn't necessarily have a lot to do with God rather than being the church of the children who love and worship God with all their hearts and souls and minds and strength and flowing from that love do all the things that others are doing. So then we turned around and we said, let's look at a number of instances from the Bible, lives from the Bible, that reflect strong relationships with God that just weren't quite right, that were a little distorted in one way or another, and how God brought them onto this foundation of love. And so we looked at Elijah, one of the great, great pillars of the Old Testament, right along with Moses, the two who are with Jesus in the transfiguration. How he was a responsible man, a knowledgeable man, the custodian of the knowledge of God at a time when it was fading. And as we said, a hard man for hard times. We looked at the background of what was going on in our sideways map. Uh, let's see, I think I've got that over here a little better. And we noticed a, a couple of things that were important to understand the life and the story of, of Elijah. How the kingdom is split, right? There's been this civil war after the death of Solomon. We have the kingdom of Judah in the south with worship at Jerusalem. And sometimes good, sometimes bad kings, still remnants of... The, the law and the worship of God. And we have the northern kingdom of Israel with the capital at Samaria. And we saw that right away when the kingdom split, Jeroboam said, what am I going to do when everybody goes to Jerusalem for the feast? And they go to the southern kingdom of Judah. They're all going to go back and want to be one kingdom again. So, do you recall what he did? How in the very south of the kingdom in Bethel, in the north of the kingdom at Dan, he sets up golden calves says, these are your gods, creates a feast in the eighth month, and institutes this false worship of God so that he keeps the people politically. Interesting how that politics keeps creeping into religion, eh? And so now we have the institution of this false mixed worship in the north. Oh, and we did have a little more we wanted to focus on that. Let's go back to one slide. There we go. So we looked at the split, the civil war, and then we see many generations go by and a particularly bad king comes up. Anyone recall his name? Think of Moby Dick. Captain Ahab. Right. So we have Ahab come on the scene. And the Bible literally says he was worse than anyone before. And do you recall who he marries? Frankie Lane. What is my Frankie Lane? Just think of Frankie Lane. Hit song. I'm not at work. Everybody here is around the same age or older or slightly younger than me. Most of you. <laughs> Jezebel. Jezebel. <laughs> Jezebel. <laughs> All right. So he marries Jezebel. Do you recall where Jezebel is from? Jezebel isn't an Israelite. Jezebel is the daughter of the king of, I think, believe it's Sidon, either Tyre or Sidon. I think it's Sidon, center of Baal worship. And so you have Ahab, this wicked king, who does what he, what he wants, who supports this worship, has his wife, who is bringing all the worship of Baal, and this worship of Baal is mingling with what was left of the worship of God and leading the people astray. And so we have the greatest crisis yet in the kingdom of the north, 
of false religion. In fact, we're going to see that Jezebel is actively trying to exterminate anyone who remembers and tries to preserve the law of God and the religion and the worship of God. And so onto the scene, suddenly out of the blue, we saw Elijah come. Let's go there. We'll pick it up. We won't go through the whole chapter, but we started in 1 Kings 17. We mentioned this is a little unusual. In most of the other prophets, those major stories, you get a little bit of the background. You get kind of this gentle introduction. Here in 1 Kings 17, you just have, bam, now Elijah the Tishbite goes to, to Ahab and says, As the Lord of God of Israel lives, be whom whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years, except by my word. Can we point out why dew was so important? Of course, there wasn't a lot of rain, but there was a lot of dew. It was important for the crops. But most of all, recall why God picks on rain. Baal was the god of what? Fertility. So Baal was the one they looked to to make sure that the crops grew and the flocks were healthy, thinking that he would provide this for him as they sacrificed to him, as they bribed him to ensure fertility. And so what does God do? He strikes at the heart of what Baal is about. And the ground, the land, becomes infertile. There's no rain. Okay, so we saw this whole thing that you know, Elijah is told to go hide. And we'll find out in a little while why he's told to, told to go hide. He hides by the brook. He's fed by the ravens. The brook dries up and God sends him all the way up to where? The heart of Baal worship. To Zarephath, right between Tyre and Sidon. To this widow. Right? We see this miraculous salvation right in the middle of Baal worship. And that's where we left off last time. We finished up this chapter. So let's go to the next chapter. Let's go to 1 Kings 18 and we'll pick up the story. And our focus here, we're going to cover a lot of ground. I don't want us to lose focus. Our focus is again looking at Elijah's relationship with God and how it matures, how it, it is on not quite the right foundation even though he's valiantly doing God's work and is a great servant of God, it's still not quite right. And we're going to see Elijah's relationship with God descend into crisis. And what God does to help Elijah build this relationship and grow until love becomes the foundation of his relationship. So let's pick up this story. We have a long way around to get to that. Lots of action in this story. So after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah revered the Lord greatly, and when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord... Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. Interesting. It reminds us of, uh, we just celebrated in the, in the Catholic liturgy, the Feast of St. Lucy. Right? The same thing, hiding Christians in the cave, bringing them bread and water. So they divided the land between them. I'm sorry, and so Ahab says to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys, Perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and mules alive and not lose some of these animals. You know, again, we don't relate to this very well. We just go to the store and somehow even if things aren't going well in our area, we have the food imported from someplace else. No rain, no food, no food. Crop, crops are down, animals die, people die. So they're getting very, very desperate. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went in one direction by himself, and Obadiah went in another direction by himself. And as Obadiah was on his way, behold, Elijah met him. And Obadiah recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is it you, my lord Elijah? And he answered him, It is I. Go, tell your lord, meaning Ahab, Behold, Elijah is here. 
And the exchange, if it weren't so serious, would almost be funny. You can always picture Eddie Murphy in this role of o Obadiah, as you see what, he, what it's going to have here. He's, he's panicking. He's, he's, what? You want me to go to Ahab? You know, see what happens here. And he said, this is Obadiah speaking in verse 9. Wherein have I sinned that you would give your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom whither my Lord has not sent to seek you. And when they would say he is not here, he would take an oath of the kingdom or nation that they had not found you. Now we know why God has hidden Elijah. Ahab's looking for him, wants to kill him, just as they've been killing all of the prophets of the Lord. And now you say, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And as soon as I have gone from you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you with her. I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me. Although I, your servant, have revered the Lord from my youth. Has it not been told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? How I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water? And now you say, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here and he'll kill me. So you can see this poor man, what he feels like, how he's, he's stuck. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand... I will surely show myself to him today. Okay, so he's not going to be whisked away. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? Interesting how sometimes we're so slow to get the point. Ahab is turning to Elijah and saying, you're the one who's troubling Israel? Really? And Elijah turns it right around. Elijah answers, I have not troubled Israel, but you have and your father's house, because you have forsaken the commandment of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now, therefore send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. Folks are important to Jezebel, instituting this Baal worship. Why Mount Carmel? Carmel was sacred to Baal. So once again, God is sending Elijah right into the heart of enemy, enemy territory to show that God is God everywhere. Remember how he said how in this culture often gods were viewed as regional? You know, they were the gods of the Philistines and they were the gods of the Hittites and they were the gods of the, uh, the Moab and, and of Ammon and of, of Damascus, of the Syrians. Yet yeah, that they were the gods of the hills and the gods of the plains. So what is God consistently doing? He's going right into the heart of this other gods area to show who really is God. So they send him to Carmel. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you go limping with two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. What had happened here was not just the worship of Baal. What was happening was the mixture of worships. It wasn't just false worship. It was synthesized worship, syncretic worship, we would say, where people had taken what they knew of God, mixed it with something else that they wanted to do instead, put them together and somehow thought that this was okay somehow thought that this was legitimate. And this is not okay. An important lesson for us today in our consumer world of religion, you know, we pick and choose, mix, mix and match off the shelf, and put together whatever we want that satisfies ourselves for religion. That is not acceptable. There is a God, 
And he brought truth. He is truth. And he walked the world with truth. It's not up to us to make up what that truth is. It's up to us whether we accept it, but it's not up to us to refashion and put, you know, take this, this part and that part and this other part and this other thing, mix them all together and come up with some religion that works for us. It's not about a religion that works for us. It's about truth. And God has shown his displeasure. Not only will he show it here, let's jump all the way to the other side of the book. Let's go to Revelation. And there are a couple of letters written to churches who have a problem with the same kind of synthesized worship, the same syncretic worship. Let's go to Revelation 2 and verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. You hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you where Satan dwells. So this is a church that's being complimented. Good things going on here. They're faithful. They're faithful under persecution. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice fornication, practice immorality. And we're not quite sure what is meant here, whether it was the actual idolatry or whether it was also Balaam had a problem. Balaam was religion for profit. Not, not profit as in a profit, profit as in corporate profits. You know, being paid to be religious and to curse Israel. And so also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Another group we don't learn about from scripture, but we learn about elsewhere. Uh, they took their name from the deacon, Nicholas, one of the first of the deacons. Not because he was a heretic or did anything wrong. He's a very noble, very holy man. He happened to have a very beautiful wife. And so people were accusing him of being lustful about this wife. And so he, he, he brings him before all the apostles and just says, look, if someone else wants her, have her. I'm not lustful about this. Not meaning that he's going to you know, share her, but to make the point that he's not lusting after this beautiful woman. He loves his, his, his wife. What was taken from that event and why they took the name of the Nicolaitans were there were Christians, or at least people claiming to be Christians, who said, well, if we're supposed to love, let's go ahead and love. If we're supposed to share and have all things in common, right? In the early church, they, they stole their goods, they had all things in common. Well, we have our goods in common and our houses in common and our wives in common, don't we? So they said, you know, when, when, we have, when we celebrate the Eucharist and we're all together, not only should we share a meal, we should share each other indiscriminately. Now, a very, very great perversion of what love is about, of what Christianity is about. And so there was this great indulgence of the flesh of saying sharing as we, we, we hold our bodies in common. And this was the heresy of the Nicolaitans. So here, even in the church, we have people who are mixing. Mixing whatever this false idolatry is from the way of Balaam. Mixing this promiscuous immorality into Christianity and polluting it. And God says, no, 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 no. Repent then. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Yeah. And we see another example of this in the next church, in verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze, I know your works, your love, and faith, and service, and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. So again, a good church, people doing good things. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel. Again, so important to understand the Old Testament, to understand the New Testament, making reference to what we're reading about right now in the life of Elijah. Okay? But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and beguiling my servants to practice immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her immorality, 
Behold, I will throw her on a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her doings. And I will strike her children dead. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you as your works deserve. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay upon you any other burden, only hold fast to what you have until I come. So again, this mixing of elements, this mixing of outside things, corrupting the faith, is not something new. And it is never something acceptable. Not in the time of Elijah, not in the time of John, and not today. So let's come back to where we left off. So here is our problem in Israel. It's not just false worship. It's synthesized worship, syncretic worship, mixing the worship of Baal and the worship of God, of Yahweh, of the Lord. And so Elijah comes to the people and says, how long we go limping with two different opinions? You can't do both of these at the same time. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And what's the response of the people? They are so confused after all of this cultural mess that the people did not answer him a word. And you can really have pity on them. Not hate them, not be angry at them, but just have pity that there's such confusion that they just don't know how much we can apply that today. Do we get angry? I hope not. I hope in mercy and in love our desire is to spread light and to spread truth in, in a world that is just as confused. So let's see what happens. So the people didn't answer him even a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us. And let them choose one bull for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire to it. You call on the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, all right, it's well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Go first. Okay. Choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first. For you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire to it. And they took the bull which was given to them, and they prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered, and they limped about the altar which they made. And at noon, Elijah, the tough guy, Elijah mocks them, saying, Cry aloud, for he's a god. Either he's musing with some mistress somewhere, as these pagan gods were reputed to do. You know, or he's gone aside, or he's on a journey, or maybe he's asleep, has to be awakened pointing out the falseness of their gods and the silliness of their gods and the futility of their gods. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. What are they doing? Trying to bribe God, trying to force his hand. Okay, those things we've spoken about in the past of these distorted relationships. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of oblation. That's an important time. We'll talk about it in a moment. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one heeded.
I didn't for the sake of time. I almost wanted to record the section of Mendelssohn's Elijah, which is this, this event. Because the music is just so touching. You see all this drama and all this nothing happening on, and suddenly this music becomes very intimate and very tender. And it kind of portrays this scene here now. There's been all this nonsense going on. And finally, in great power and in great tenderness, Elijah calls the people back. And Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. Tying back God to Israel. Israel has gone astray. But God is so intimate with Israel, even giving them their name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bowl in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four jars of water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. Of course, water is in short supply right now, right? So they go ahead and they, they do this. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran about the altar and filled the trench also with water. So everything is drenched. The wood is drenched. Water is all around. The, the bowl is drenched. And at the time of the offering of oblation, what are we talking about here? In the temple, a continuous sacrifice was supposed to be offered every morning and every evening. There was the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. And this was an essential part of the worship. In fact, this is one of the great tragedies when the temple is, is destroyed, is taking away the morning and evening sacrifice. And this was so symbolic of the worship of Israel. And it had been taken away from the land of Israel. No more morning and evening sacrifice. We still do this today in the breviary, in the Catholic liturgy, I believe the Orthodox liturgy, and many others pray the divine office outside of, of the Catholic and the Orthodox worlds. The two major prayers, the morning prayer and the evening prayer, an imitation of the sacrifices of the temple, the morning offering and the evening offering. So here we have Elijah in this event hearkening right back to the true worship of God. When does he do this? The time of the evening sacrifice. The time, by the way, when Jesus was sacrificed as our sacrifice. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, of the offering of the oblation Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things, withholding the rain, what he's, what he's been doing, all these things at your word. Answer me, Lord. Answer me, that this people may know that you, O oh Lord, are God, and you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. The Lord, Yah, is God. In Hebrew, El. What are they saying? Eliah, Eliah. Elia, in English transliteration, Elijah, Elijah, Elijah. This is Elijah's name, that Yah is God. Yah is El. So they all fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he's God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal, and let not one of them escape. And they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and killed them there. And Elijah says to Ahab, Go up, 
eat and drink. It's a sacrifice after all, isn't it? <laughs> Go up, eat and drink, for there's a sound of the rushing of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he bowed himself down to the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There's nothing. And he said, Go again, seven times. And at the seventh time he said, Behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising out of the sea. And he said, Go up, say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. And in a little while the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahab rose and went to Jezreel. Let's take a look at this for just a moment. Yeah, let's get over here. If you have your maps handy. So we've got Carmel is over here, jutting out into the ocean. All right, there's where Carmel is. Jezreel is, I should blow this up a little bit. Here we are. Jezreel is all the way over here. It's a distance of about 17 miles that Ahab is trying to cover on chariot, coming down out of the mountains across the plain to Jezreel. And look what happens. So Ahab rode, gets in his chariot, and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance to Jezreel. So by God's spirit, he actually outruns the chariot for 17 miles and lands in Jezreel before Ahab does. But it's a tremendous, tremendous miracle, this tremendous renewal of turning the people back to God of helping them realize and recapture the true worship, that it's not a mixture, that it's not Baal, that it's God, and Elijah is his prophet. But evil does not sit idly by and just let this happen. So even as we do in our own lives, evil strikes back. Ahab told Jezebel, we're in 1 Kings 19 now. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had slain all the prophets of Baal with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Jezebel isn't playing around. Mean lady. And notice what happens. Then he, Elijah, was afraid. And he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Let's take a look at this again in your maps. So we left... Elijah up here in Jezreel, right? And where does he go? Beersheba. All the way down here. To the south side of the kingdom of Judah. He's actually left Israel. He's left the land where God sent him to be the prophet and to bring the people back. And he's fled not only across the border, he's fled way across the border, all the way down to the south. So Elijah goes to the south, he leaves his servant in the town of Beersheba, and he continues on into the desert. South end of this, now we're getting in, into the desert. This is rough area. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. I thought just, just for curiosity, so everyone knows, what does a broom tree look like? I, I did find a picture floating around out there. 
So to have an idea of what he's sitting under in the middle of the desert, that's what a broom tree looks like. So not a whole lot of shade, but at least something to shade from the desert. That's a broom tree. But what's more important is what happens under the broom tree. So he goes a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die. He asks for God to kill him. Saying, it's enough. It's enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I'm no better than my father's. This great man of God, this man who has been so courageous to this point, this man who has been so strong to this point, this man who against all odds has kept the knowledge of the true God alive, this man who's been so responsible and done anything and everything that God has asked him, relying upon miracles just to stay alive, has finally said, it's enough. I failed. I'm no better than my father's. Just end it now. Elijah's relationship with God is in crisis. For Elijah, as good and as noble and as valiant and as amazing as he has been, something wrong in the relationship. His relationship has been built upon this knowledge, I am the prophet of the Lord, as the Lord lives before whom I stand. He's been the responsible servant of God. He's got a job to do and he's going to do it for God no matter what. And it all falls apart. And so the foundation of his relationship with God has been broken. He's the knowledgeable man, but the people haven't turned. Jezebel's got them turned back. He's the responsible man. He's done everything, and he's still failed. I'm useless to you, God. I'm useless. I'm no better than my father's. Just end it now. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat, and let's see what God is now going to do in the life of Elijah to get this man back up and running, but now running on the right foundation of a God who is love, not a God who is thunder and lightning and fire from heaven. So an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold... There was, a, uh, there was at his head a, a, a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. You always sense how depressed he is. He just, he just can't get going. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, else the journey will be too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. Horeb is another name for Sinai. Ring any bells of who else was at Sinai? The other great pillar of the Old Testament? Moses. Moses, also there. And when Moses was up on the mountain, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. See the parallels? This is Elijah, again, the great messenger of God, just as Moses was. Forty days and forty nights fasting, coming to Horeb, coming to Sinai. And we'll see what happens. And he came to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? The one who's supposed to be up in the north, right? All the way down the south. What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah says, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, slain your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before 
the Lord. Again, another reference. Remember Moses. He's on the mountain. And his friendship is so deep with God, he asks to see God. And what does God do? He says, well, you can't see me and live. So he puts him in a cleft of the rock in the mountain, puts his hand over him and passes in front of him so that Moses can see God's back, it says. And his name is proclaimed. So Moses is put in the cleft of the rock so that he can see God. So what happens? God tells to Elijah, go forth and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and broke in pieces the rock before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. This is so Elijah, right? The guy who calls down fire from heaven on the people, the 50, a captain of 50 who's coming after him, calls down fire from heaven onto, onto the bull, slaughters the prophets of Baal. This is so Elijah. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. All these things that Elijah knew, all this way of God that Elijah envisioned, God wasn't there. What happens? When Elijah, uh, after the fire, a still, small voice. A still, small voice voice. And we'll find out more about the still small voice after we take a break. <laughs> 